Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you extra nuggets and information to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of this war in Ukraine. Where should we start today? Well, I'm going to go to the retired general Mick Ryan, Australian general, who always gives us insightful uh, threads on uh, all things uh, military with regard to this war. He says, as a one year anniversary of Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine approaches, the Russian army has commenced the preliminary phase of its 2023 offensives. A thread on what is occurring and why the Russians have chosen now to commence them. I have been discussing over the last week whether this is an offensive, whether it's a pre offensive offensive. If it's a pre offensive offensive, it's still using up, uh, attriting the forces that the Russians would need for a proper offensive. And it seems to be rather bizarre. Um, it could be part of the deep operation or deep battle doctrine where they are attacking on multiple places along the front line to try and find a weakness and then piling in second echelon. But where is that second echelon? Do they have a lot of troops and material stored somewhere ready for this attack? These kind of uh, approaches are quite difficult given satellite imagery these days. That, that means it's very difficult to hide people and equipment anywhere, so on and so forth. So, and but. And then if this is the offensive, it's really underwhelming and uh, it shows that Russia are in trouble. So, you know, what, what is what is going on exactly? Anyway, let's see if Mick Ryan can cast some uh, light on this. So over the past week, Russia has conducted attacks in, at Svatva, uh, Solidar, Bakhmut, Dvorichna, Vukhlida and other locations. These are unlikely to be main campaigns, the main campaign that Russian military bloggers had hoped for and that Ukrainian Ukrainian intelligence officials had warned about. Assuming that there is a larger campaign plan at work, these recent attacks are likely to have been probes and reconnaissance and force missions to ascertain or test the Ukrainian strengths, dispositions and reactions. So again, this is the deep, deep battle uh, doctrine. It seems, despite the ability of satellites, reconnaissance drones, and electronic warfare to provide insights into an enemy's locations, their true strength reactions and will on the ground can only be determined on the ground. Thus, these preliminary Russian activities. Why is Russia beginning these offensive activities in Ukraine now? There are three reasons. Well, the first and most important is political. President Putin needs a victory. His forces over the past 12 months have suffered battlefield defeats in the north, south and east of Ukraine. The strategic missile campaign to terrorize Ukrainians by targeting their power infrastructure has resulted in no political accommodations from Ukraine. Instead, it has resulted in increased Western assistance, such as economic aid, munitions, tanks and air defence systems. Putin needs offensives to take ground and generate momentum in Ukraine as well as in the global influence battle. And he has to demonstrate to the Russian people by the first anniversary of his invasion that progress is being made. This is very interesting because I've talked before about giving a date, putting a date on an offensive forces the Russians to do something which they might not otherwise be ready for. So saying, right, we need a Donbass by the end of March because it's kind of, it has political meaning, it is, it's symbolically meaningful, so on and so forth, um, means that he's pressuring the Russians to to create a massive offensive when their forces might not be well trained enough, they might not have the material in place, etc., etc. And then that means they're hasty and ill-prepared and there is less success for that uh, operation. So that's that's somewhat controversial. A second reason Russia has com commenced, says uh, Ryan, the preliminary operations for their offensives is to disrupt future Ukrainian offensives. President Zelensky, in multiple speeches, has outlined his intention to take back all Ukrainian territory occupied by Russia, including Crimea. Therefore, to force the Ukrainians to use their military to defend against Russian attacks instead of conducting their own offensives, the Russians will use their assaults in the coming weeks to spoil at least some of the Ukrainian 2023 offensives. Finally, the Russian High Command will want to ensure that Russian forces are in a better position to hold more defensible grounds before the full effect of recent Western donations of tanks, armoured vehicles and munitions can be brought to bear by the Ukrainians. A large amount of Western aid announced in January will soon begin to arrive in Ukraine. It will take some time for new equipment to be fully absorbed into the Ukrainian army formations, but by the second quarter of 2023, Ukraine's offensive potential will be much greater. Despite their desire to regain the initiative, Russia's of Offensive potential is questionable. There has been an influx of mobilised Russian troops, but their most important impact on the this war is likely to have been the stabilisation of the Russian defensive line over winter. Offensive operations are 
a different concern. These require well-trained and equipped soldiers and top-notch leaders, as well as detailed planning and rehearsals at all levels. Tens of thousands of new inexperienced soldiers in a depleted Russian army will not provide this. But this is the idea that um, they are just not the Russians are just not in a very good position to do a massive offensive. They don't have the material. They don't really have the troops. They may have a whole bunch of mobilized troops, so that doesn't mean they'd be good for doing. Op operations that require a, a good degree of training i mean th this is this is the the main uh utility of ground troops right they this is what all their training is for like this is if you like the culmination of their training uh, and so therefore you would expect the most um well carried out offensive operations will be those carried out by the most well-trained troops who are most ready for that kind of activity. Throwing mobilized troops into that really degrades the potential for Russia to be successful here and is is, is a challenge to them, um, you know, achieving any objectives they might set out. Uh, therefore, he continues, when the Russians commence their main offensive operations, they are unlikely to achieve a bold operational breakthrough, hey, where they penetrate deep into Ukrainian territory, destroying logistics, artillery and HQ and dislocating the Ukrainian defensive line. Russia no longer has a quantity of well-trained conventional forces this requires, nor the ability to exercise on-the-spot initiative to rapidly exploit Ukrainian tactical failures. Russian losses in leaders, equipment and confidence in the past year mitigate against this. The Battle of Bakhmut and a recent catastrophic Russian attack at Vukhladar demonstrate own ongoing weaknesses in Russian offensive capacity and fighting power. What we are more likely to witness in the coming weeks is a series of rolling Russian attacks across many parts of the Eastern Front, from Svatova to the north of Vukla, in the north to Vukhladar in the south. Russian forces are likely to conduct battalion and brigade-sized attacks. These will probably be a mix of human wave and combined arms activities, something which the Russians have previewed in their attacks around Bakhmut and Solodar. And we've heard uh, today, I reported in the news video, that there are supposedly Russian air forces amassing at the borders in airfields in Russia. And this might you know, foreshadow a combined arms attack coming soon, you know, a larger military offensive. So... I mean, you would expect that if they are going to do a major offensive, you would expect it to be a combined arms initiative, right? Ukraine has been preparing for their own offensives for some time. With the arrival of new Western equipment in the coming weeks, it should be ready to launch them soon. Ukraine must balance defending its territory and the attendant political and military considerations with the preservation and capacity building of the Ukrainian army for the offensives to come. The coming weeks will be an interesting time for the Ukrainian high command. The interesting thing to consider here is that you're not going to win battles defensively, but at the same time, you're not going to lose them. A game of football, right? If, if you don't let them score any goals, if your defence is absolutely resolute, then you can't lose. But you still have to eventually, if you want to win, you have to go on the offensive and score a goal. You, you, can't, you can't win a game of football without scoring a goal. And you can't do that unless you're attacking them in some, in some way. But what? But but in war, the analogy kind of breaks down because in war, what you do in the defense, in this kind of attritional defense, if the offen offensive side is losing more troops, uh, and that includes at times capability in losing key types of equipment on uh, as they as they trit away in their offensives, the Ukrainians are gaining slowly an advantage. Okay, there's a numbers game. It depends how many people you got to throw at the problem. But ostensibly, I'm saying that that even though the Ukrainians are sitting back on the defense now, they can they might be able to defend in such a way that it it degrades the Russian offensive capabilities, you know, really quite fundamentally, and then allows when they do go on the offensive, then the, the Ukrainians to be even more effective. So, so there is essentially an offensive dimension to their defense at the moment, if you get what I'm saying. Anyway, it's just me talking off the top of my head there. Let's go on to talk about a comment here from someone uh, actually a few days ago, uh, Radhika Pereira. I, I'm talking about his reply here, which will then lead me on to talk about, in answering that, to, to bring in another source I was going to talk about anyway. Uh, so he says, they are not, right, okay, let, let's, Let's 
go to his original comment. So calling this a proxy war would undermine the whole moral value ATP would like to attach to this war. Okay, I forget that point. If this is a proxy war, the US is not supporting Ukraine out of any sense of moral duty they feel they have toward Ukraine or intentional order or anything, but to weaken Russia. If Russia is significantly weakened, uh, so they wouldn't be able to challenge a US interest in the near future, US would consider this war a win for them. I, th I think that's absolutely correct. But it might not be the only reason, as I go on to say, is they, these aren't mutually exclusive. They could be doing this for moral purposes and for their own gain. But what? But that does not necessarily mean Russia would lose. Russia could still retain a part of Ukraine and still be weakened, and the US would simply move on to another matter like China. Herein lies the whole problem with proxy wars. Uh, I say, I'm not sure these things are mutually exclusive. And he says, yes, you're right. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. But at the same time, there is no logical connection between the two of them either. In fact, the evidence suggests that the US do not want to give the U uh, Ukraine the heavy weapons to to uh, finish a job in on Russia. One has to wonder why that is. Is that because of threat of escalation or because they do not want Russia defeated outright? Because that would essentially destabilise a region that the US is actively trying to move away from. In any case, if the US is trying to hurt Russia's capabilities and not help Ukraine achieve a quick victory, uh, do you think this is morally this is a morally right thing to do? And I've actually talked about this at length in the past, and this is a really good question. And I, I'm not sure I have the, the answer because I'm I flip flop between what R U U.S.'s intentions are. So on the one hand, you could say, and Lloyd Austin said this back in April, that the U.S. are trying to want Russia to be degraded fundamentally, so they can't do this ever again. In other words, they need to be so thoroughly degraded that that they have no ability to start war with anyone else in the future. And in order to thoroughly degrade them, so the theory goes. America is uh, giving Ukraine weapons just when they need them, enough weapons to just, over time, fundamentally attrit Russia, rather than give them all the weapons they need to win a quick war. And it's a quick victory, but Russia is still there. They, they might lose in Ukraine, but actually they've still got all their, the troops they can still mobilise. They've still got you know, uh, the ability to, to make a comeback within five, ten years or whatever. And, and so there is a theory that, that you don't give them everything straight away because that's just that short-term win. We need Russia out of the game for a long time. But again, how, how does that work morally? Uh, uh, and is that really what, what America's trying to do? Or are there other things at play? So it could be elements of that, but then it's really difficult for America to just give Ukraine a bunch of stuff uh, because, well, first of all, there was a whole escalation thing. So they're worried about nuclear war. That's why they won't partly partly the reason why they weren't giving big stuff and uh, and they didn't want to cross these red lines because crossing the red lines would would possibly make P putin press a the big nuclear button but it turns out that that is an empty threat and it looks like he's not going to do that and america have warned what would happen if that happens i don't i don't think that's on the cards anymore so then you've seen america start to give more and more stuff but it's not as easy it's, it's easier said than done so things like jets are massively complicated, and I'd really advise people go and, and watch a fantastic um, video by uh, Justin Bronk and Ward. Uh, let's have a look at it. Do, do, do. No. Uh, which is um, a really good uh, video that explains why it's really difficult to give fighter uh, fighter jets to Ukraine. And this is which uh, is Ward Carroll with Justin Bronk from the Royal United Services Institute, which NATO fighter is best for Ukraine. Go and watch that. Definitely go and watch it. I watched it on 1.75 speed. It was perfect. Such an interesting, I'm going to excerpt some of that in my next extra video. Uh, but the idea is actually, it's easy to say, why doesn't, don't the UK, America give a bunch of jets to uh to Ukraine well actually because they can't really do that for a whole bunch of reasons they're not the right jets for this kind of warfare they're not actually conducting the right warfare for the NATO jets just in general um, only certain jets would be anywhere near effective in this kind of warfare which is gri gripping really and there aren't that many of them uh, so on and so forth and which is absolutely fascinating so it's it's easy to say give a bunch of jets Andrew Perpetua is saying it today. Just get, just get it done. Give a bunch of jet and train. Give them. But actually, you need the right weaponry on the jets. You need the right runways. You need the right X, Y, and Z. You need the right logistics chains. Uh, you need the right training. And even then, they don't. The, the airspace is too contested to have that. Have these 
jets used in in that way. It's just the wrong war for these jets because because the war hasn't been fought as a NATO war, and you haven't got the combined arms initiative, uh, combined arms like setup of of everything operating as per a NATO war would. Then these planes can't be used because they're NATO planes and and it's not a NATO war. It's this kind of weird mix of all kind of wars. It's got elements of NATO, but a lot of Soviet and doctrine from everywhere and all sorts. And you can't just say, yeah, throw a bunch of jets um, at, at the problem. In the same way, you can't say throw a bunch of tanks until you sorted out a bunch of other things and logistics and this and that and ammunition, so on and so forth. And so you've seen these things eventually get given, but then the argument is why it wasn't given earlier. Well, there were some reasons why it's delayed maybe, but there are also some reasons why it's, it's a bit of a problem to give them as well. And then countries have to think about their own um, needs and their own territorial integrity going forward. So let's talk about ATACMs in, in that respect, in, in this context of um, thinking about whether it should be given straight away or whether the delay is intentional, so on and so forth. So this is a Politico article, and I was having a chat, someone in the um, in my threads was saying that actually one of the reasons ATACMs are not being given is not because... So the, the theory is that these are being drawn down, like they're being phased out ATACMs, and they have 300 kilometer uh, range, and these are perfect things to be given. Why haven't they be given? Well, be, well, because they're being phased out, so they don't need them. Well, actually, it appears that that's somewhat incorrect now. That the, the America are actually thinking they do need them if, if there's going to be a Pacific theater of war against China, maybe around Taiwan, where you're going to need that kind of distance overseas and uh, so on and so forth, or islands or whatever. So, in the Pacific, ATACMs might well be very useful. In other words, actually, we don't we we're not going to phase them out, and we're not going to necessarily give them away. We need to keep hold of them. We've only got so many, et cetera, et cetera. So, let's have a look and see what this Politico article says. So US tells Ukraine it won't send long range missiles because it has few to spare. Now that's a bizarre thing to say if you had them all to spare because you are phasing them out. In recent meetings at the Pentagon, US officials told Kyiv's representatives that it doesn't have any army tactical missile systems to spare, according to four people with knowledge of the talks. Transferring ATACMs to the battlefield in Eastern Europe would dwindle America's stockpiles and harm the US military's readiness for a future fight people said. Uh, the Pentagon's assessment of its stockpiles is informed in part by how many weapons and munitions planners think they might need to confront an enemy. Those plans have not been significantly revised since the start of the war in Ukraine and have not re recalibrated what the stockpiles the US might need in a reserve to face a weakened Russia or account for the fact that Ukraine is essentially fighting the war right now. Uh, this is a little bit odd because, I mean, without wanting to mention proxy war again, this is to this is to say that Ukraine are effectively fighting on behalf of the US here, as in, you know, the, the recalibration of stockpiles is like, okay, we've got, so I'm going to make this up, we've got a thousand ATACMs, like we, we need to keep them back for fighting against Russia in the future. Oh, Ukraine is fighting against Russia now, let's give them to Ukraine. In other words, they are fighting on behalf of us and that, that future fight we might have with Russia, we might as well give them to them now. So that that's a kind of recalibration. But I think the main idea here is that, that as I say, the, the use for them in the Pacific theatre. Uh, Lockheed Martin has produced around 4,000 ATACMs in various configurations over the past two decades. Some of these missiles have been sold to allied nations, which bought the missile for their own multiple uh, rocket launcher systems. Around 600 were fired by the US forces in combat during the Persian Gulf, Persian Gulf War and the Iraq War. Um, the other issue of, of uh, sending ATACMs, that it's too aggressive a move by Biden's team, remains. But Ukrainian officials have heard such arguments about other weapons before, only for the Biden administration to re reverse course and send artillery, missile defences and tanks. I don't think that that's... I, I don't think that the red line of escalation is relevant for ATACMs. I think there are other considerations. I think they're thinking China. Um, and... Uh, yeah, uh, to me, I would just be, I, I just think these would be huge games, game changer. And I cannot really understand why the US hasn't sent these to uh, to Ukraine. But as, as other people told me, it is, they say, you know, in the literature saying apparently, and I have seen somewhere else, I just couldn't find the article mentioning the Pacific Theatre, uh, saying that actually that that's one of the main considerations now for not sending ATAC. And so... It, it's not not some kind of drawdown scenario. Um, I don't know. Let let me know what you think. Why do you think 
the US are not sending aid tokens. Uh, and then, you know, it comes back to this talk here about whether they are, whether the, why are the US not giving as much as they can straight away? Um, and, and does that fit into this slow degradation theory? Or is it because actually there are other variables at play here that mean that they can't just give stuff straight away? It takes a long time. I remember reading your thread by Mark Hartling that was talking about, you just got to understand that you, we don't have warehouses of these things sitting around to give away. Although arguably you, the US does have warehouses of huge amounts of stock of some like ve certain types of vehicles that they could do that with. Um, and in fact, they are doing that with to some degree. But anyway, the, the, when, when it comes to munitions, less so. They don't just have these warehouses, these ready to give away. And it's like, right, pack them up, send them to Ukraine, job done. Obviously, you've got logistics, you've got training, you've got all sorts of other things to think about. Um, and as well, technology being exploited by Russia if they if they capture these things. This, this is one of the things that was talked about with the Bradley, uh, sorry, with the Abrams tanks. Uh, it turns out that America, the US are now building those tanks to send rather than sending existing stocks because the ones in the existing stocks have depleted uranium armor and they don't want to, those to be captured by Russia, so they have to make them without depleted uranium armor, so on and so forth. So I don't know. Tell me what you think about all, all these things. Um, okay, talking about lancets. Lancets are still a thorn in the side of the Ukrainians. These are the lottery munitions, kamikaze drones that get used. Uh, and I've seen lots of footage over the last few days. There's one of a tug being hit on the Dnipro uh, by a lancet. Here's a lancet hitting an M. Uh, 109A3GN self-propelled howitzers. So these are NATO howitzers, bog, bog standard. Oh, Jesus, bog standard um, uh, pieces of kit here. These SPGs, but this is a, this is a fascinating bit of footage because it, it's almost as if this SPG uh, just shrugs off the Lancet drone. Shut up. Um. Anyway, here you are. There's a, that's where it's taken place. Um. There's the SPG. There it is firing. So this is active. It's an SPG that's is not like being abandoned or anything. And the loitering munition aiming for it. Interestingly, there's a guy here that runs away, realizes it's coming. This thing explodes, but these things don't have huge munitions. And I don't know whether this would be the sort of target I'd be setting for one of these. I guess if it's been in the air for some time, it needs to find a target. It can't just forever fly around so it sees this it goes for it but it's it's shrugged it off there and that is um these guys are running away hasn't hasn't harmed any of these guys who are either in it or just behind it and yeah literally just it doesn't literally shrug it off it metaphorically shrugs it off um language pierce uh yeah just quite quite ineffective i would have thought it, there may be damage to to the vehicle that's made it inoperable i can't tell for sure but uh, yeah uh, lancers are a problem but they also aren't hugely powerful and so they have to get that hit right this is um rather yeah something to think about russian soldier has died from the explosion of a gun that was loaded with deliberately damaged or manipulated bullets and this is coming from a Russian source. Attention, the enemy deliberately abandons unusable ammunition. Frontline soldiers report that one of our servicemen loaded a trophy caliber 5.45C into a gun. As a result, the gun partially tore apart from the explosion and our fighter died. According to the colleagues of the deceased, the enemy deliberately manufactures unusable ammunition so that it gets our, to our servicemen. Previously, there have been reports that the enemy is mining the places where weapons and ammunition are stored in strong points. There's talk about Krasnohora taken in Bakhmut and about how they had uh, sort of mined and booby-trapped a lot of houses in the area, and that could have caused the Russians a bit of an issue. Anyway, let's look at timing, because this would be one of these long threads. Okay, let's go for it. I talked to you about rifling from Thomas Tyner. He's an artilleryman or former artilleryman, and talked about how rifling works on barrels, and then mentioned smoothbore how just really quickly if you didn't see that go and check the previous extra yesterday or the day before rifling has these grooves down them which rotates the ordnance as it comes out uh, like bullets like handheld rifles but in, in terms of howitzers and cannons and, and guns on a on a tank barrels on a tank you often have these uh, and the accuracy and uh range of the munition is improved 
by by the rifling and it kind of squashes bits of metal or plastic or whatever around these bits of ordnance or in, in bullets like the whole length of it squeezes it into the rifling so that it then rotates and fires out um, the other option is using fins so smooth ball you have no rifling inside the barrel the barrel is smooth inside and you send out a piece of ordnance and then fins flip out and that stabilizes it so that it, it it's accurate and doesn't wobble and go off course. So that's just a quick synopsis. All current Western tanks except the Challenger 2, so there's a UK tank that's been sent out, 14 of them, uses different munitions because it has a rifled bore and, and all other NATO tanks have smooth bore. Use 120mm smooth bore tank guns. Leopard 2, M1A1, M1A2, Abrams, K1A1, K1A2, Type 90, Type 10, Arietta, uh, Ar uh, McCaver Mc, uh, 3, McCaver 4, and Leclerc, although the Leclerc uses a 120mm and an L52 can. Anyway, there you go. All uses that, uh, apart from the Challenger. Um, and uh, 120 L55 cannon, Leopard 2, K2 Black Panther, Alte, Challenger 3. So when the Challenger 2 gets the upgrade, it will have a smooth bore barrel. Older Western tanks, the Leopard 1, M60 Patton, K1, McCabe 1 and 2, and Rifle 105 cannons, as do current Western fire support vehicles, Centauro, M1128, MGS, Type 16, Griffin 2. They uh, they will use rifled, yeah, rifled 105 cannons. So the only outliers to this rule, older tanks use 105mm rifled, modern tanks use 120 smoothbore, are the British Army's chieftain. Challenger 1 and Challenger 2 tanks which use 120 millimeter rifled guns rifle gun spin stabilized projectiles while smooth ball guns use fin stabilized projectiles so you can see the rifling there that is kind of it curves around to give the rotation um if you're not familiar with these terms please read my recent thread about the differences between rifled and smooth ball that's the one i i read to you uh, and the different types of projectile stabilization. To understand why NATO began to use smoothbore barrels, we have to look at three types of modern anti-tank ammunition, which are depicted in this photo of a Leopard 1 anti-tank ammo. APDS, superseded by APFSDS, heat, the two rounds in the center, and HESH, or HEP, there. Okay, and goes on to explain. So HESH, or HEP, or high explosive squash head, high explosive plastic rounds are not designed to penetrate armor. Hesh rounds have a thin metal hull and are filled with plastic explosive, which upon impact will be squashed against the enemy armor before being detonated by the fuse. Located in the rear of the round, the detonation creates a shock wave that passes through the armor and creates supersonic metal spall. I've talked about this in a video a long time ago, but this is really good explanation. Splinters inside the enemy vehicle. So that shock and that explosion on as it squashes onto the onto the armor creates like all these kind of splinters that go around inside the tank that basically shred everything, including people. Um, so left the impact outside the tank, right spalling inside the tank. Um, it's the same principle as Newton's cradle. Due to the thin shells, H Hesh rounds are fired at low muzzle velocities at 650 to 750 meters a second. Hesh rounds are ideal for rifle guns as the spin stabilization centrifugal forces help create a more effective explosive patch. Hesh rounds are most effective against metal armor, but since the late Cold War armored vehicles are composite armor with layers of metal, plastics, and ceramics, and often include special armor, uh, equal empty space between armored layers, which neutralizes Hesh rounds. So it doesn't always, you know, a Hesh round, it depends what your target is as to how effective it is. So explosive, so that, that, that yeah, that, that, the spalling is what does the damage to the inside of the tank. Explosive reactive armor, ERA, i.e. the bricks on the Ukrainian tank here, um, and I've explained them before, also reduce the effectiveness of HESH. As all modern armored vehicles use spool liners, um, HESH is now obsolete in tank warfare. HESH is still used by fire support vehicles to breach concrete obstacles. These um, ERA will explode as, as the projectile hits, and that explosion, it's like plastic explosive on the outside of the armor. You think that's weird. Why would you put explosives as protection? But actually explodes out the projectile back outwards. So it kind of that that 
explosion protects the armor itself. Heat or high explosive anti-tank rounds use an explosively formed penetrator to defeat enemy armor. This penetrator is formed by explosively collapsing a thin co conical metal liner into a Mac 25 fast metal jet which penetrates the armor. This video compares Hesh and Heat. So let's have a look at this video. Against the target Hesh high explosive squash head. Heat high explosive anti-tank. These two rounds first saw use in World War II. For these ammo types, distance or kinetic energy are not a factor once they reach their target. Hesh is a slow speed round that uses concussive explosive energy to damage the interior of the target. Hesh contains a thin casing with a plastic explosive that flattens against the target before exploding. Once the round is partially squashed, the plastic explosive ignites. The concussive energy transfers through and pieces of the armor or equipment inside become the destructive elements. Heat contains an inverted cone-shaped charge with a... So imagine all the equipment inside, all the, you know, stuff that you're using to fire the guns or the computer stuff or whatever, all that equipment, inside, anything in there, that explosive impact will send that flying around at, at crazy rates, just shredding everything. So the equipment itself gets destroyed and then people using that equipment get sort of, you know, into a, a, a spot of bother. Metallic liner. Once the round reaches the target, it detonates, creating a molten metal hypersonic jet. This explosively formed penetrator requires standoff distance to form its maximum penetrating power. Research has shown the more angled the cone is, the more concentrated the jet becomes, increasing its force and penetration distance. Advances in technology have mitigated these effects, such as explosive reactive armor and composite armor with ceramic plates and other materials. Spaced or slat armor also reduces the effects due to causing premature detonation. So when you see things like the wolfhounds and these, uh, uh, the British have a lot of this kind of stuff on their MRAPs and APCs and whatnot, mine-resistant ambush protection vehicles, because they protect in a way uh, explained here. Uh, you get other type, types of armor and then modern composite armor indeed uh, protects against such um, uh, projectiles. Heat rounds are less effective when fired from a rifled barrel as a spinning disperses the metal jet. Heat rounds are most effective when detonated at a specific distance to the target, hence the protruding tip with the trigger that makes heat rounds easy to recognize. The larger the diameter of the heat round, the deeper the penetration, but a larger diameter reduces the round's accuracy at longer distances. Heat rounds are also used in other short to medium range anti-tank weapons like Palm 2. So these are like, um, these are mine systems where instead of like driving over a mine and exploding underneath, you, you drive over or past the trigger and it fires off from the side. Panzerfaust three, Carl Gustav, et cetera, et cetera. So these sort of anti-tank guided missiles. Um, slat armor, spaced armor and ceramics and plastics in composite armor reduce the effectiveness of heat rounds, while explosive reactive armor almost always neutralizes them. Heat rounds uh, can be fired from rifled barrels, but to be effective, the explosion of the charge has to impart an opposite spin to the jet. This can be achieved by the shape of the liner or by manipulating its crystalline structure. Once the armor has been penetrated, splinters and spawn of the hypersonic jet will injure or kill the tank crew. Uh, photo of heat impacts. Um, so there you go, uh, lots of different types of impact there. Um, yeah, this brings us to the most used and effective anti-tank munition. APDS, armor piercing discarding sabot, uh, if spin stabilized. AF, APF, SDS, armor piercing fin stabilized discarding sabot, if fin stabilized. So you get uh, the um, yeah different types uh, there. Uh, well, actually, no, these these are yeah pictured. These are fin stabilized ones. So I don't know where the, where the fins are. They obviously pop out. Um, one assumes. Um, so both consist of a sub kind of a kinetic uh, energy penetrator surrounded by a sabot, which it propels, which propels the round through the barrel and is discarded once the round has left the barrel. ASDS and APF SDS do not contain any explosive and their penetration energy comes from the firing. 
So let's have a look at this little video to get an understanding of that. Materials that are Armor piercing fin stabilized discarding sabot. It's a kinetic energy projectile fired from a smooth board barrel to destroy armored targets. A sabot is an outer shell which helps propel a heavy hardened dart. As the shell leaves the barrel, the supporting sabot peels away with only the dart flying to the target. Fins enable stability from tumbling in flight and some are modified to allow a bit of rotational spin for increased accuracy. The core is composed of tungsten or depleted uranium, materials that are denser or heavier than the armor intended to protect. On impact, the nose collapses leaving a denser hardened dart to penetrate the armor. Traveling up to five times the speed of sound, the effect on the armor's materials can behave like fluid bending and piercing through, releasing fragments on the inside. Due to heavier weight and hardness of the dart along with a small area of impact, the armor cannot effectively stop the shot unless the kinetic energy has been depleted by excessive distance, angle, or explosive reactive armor. These rounds are an essential part of main battle tanks arsenals throughout the world. Interesting. Um, so sorry. Uh... Um, I didn't finish that sentence. ASDS and APF SDS do not contain any explosive and their penetration energy comes from the firing of the tank gun. This means higher muzzle velocities result in better effects of the targets. Rifle barrels decrease muscle. So basically, the faster these things can be fired, the more effective they are. But having rifling on the bore, on, on the barrel, actually decreases the speed. So these become less effective using rifle barrels. Rifle barrels decrease muscle velocity by 20 to 30% and require bigger charges to achieve the same kinetic energy. So in order to get that speed, you need to use more, you know, greater levels of charges, to get greater explosive charge so as it's fired off um, or that causes it to fire off. Um, uh, the say, so bigger charges are needed to achieve, achieve the same kinetic energy as smoothbore barrels. Bigger charges increase wear, so the rifling will then wear down because you're using greater charges inside the barrel. In short, smoothbore guns punch harder and last longer. With the Challenger 3 update, so if this is the type of um, munition that is now being used, Armor because Hesh and, and other, other munitions are sort of not as effective, then you need you need a a, a cannon that, that can a barrel that can fire that and Challenger two can't really do that and NATO have gone smoothball because of that. So in short, smoothball guns punch harder and last longer. With the Challenger three update, uh, uh, the Challenger two, the the last Western tank with a rifle barrel will receive a new turret with a 120 mil L55 smoothball barrel. By the way, L55 is the length of the barrel, 120 millimeters by 55. Um, equals 6.6 .6 meters. Okay, so the longer the barrel, uh, the longer and higher the peak pressure from the propellant, which results in higher velocities. Kinetic energy penetrators exist, uh, exit sorry, smoothbore barrels at around Mach 5, which is 1,650 to 1,800 meters per second, depending on the barrel length, propellant, penetrator density, and length. By the way, never stand in front of a tank. The three discarded Sabah pieces... Uh, fly and are deadly for 200 meters. One Sabbat piece of the AF APF SDS round this Australian MA1A1 just fired hit the ground in front of the tank. Um, so that that is it there. Bosh. Uh, simplified, harder, longer, denser, penetrates deeper, and so all Western APF SDS penetrators are made from depleted uranium and tungsten. APF SDS training rounds, like the ones this Challenger 2 fires, are made from cheaper alloys and have a much reduced penetration power. So cheaper munitions, but less effective. When an APF SDS round hits an enemy tank, the armor and penetrator behave like fluids. I massively simplify the physics here, and the penetrator will flow through the armor. Once the armor is penetrated, splinters and spore will annihilate the tank crew. So just like the previous ones, the explosions inside the tank will send out stuff or as, as a projectile goes through the tank, the other side of the armor and, and bits will of, of the projectile will, will spore, you know, will fly through the tank and just basically destroy everything, uh, particularly the crew. Um, uh, Russian tanks are defenseless against Western APF SDS rounds. Not even active protection systems can stop them. However, Western tanks have extremely dense armor, which will stop Russian APF SDS rounds. The denser the armor, the easier to defeat APF SDS, hence the M1A2 Abrams. So 
going back to why the Amer uh, why the US aren't providing Abrams tanks that they've got in stock because they've got depleted uranium armor. Why do they have depleted uranium armor? Because that stops these kinds of projectiles. Because as he mentioned in the video, if the armor if, if the projectile is denser than the armor, it will just fly through the armor like liquid. You know, it turns it into liquid as it hits it. But if, if the armor is just as dense, then it can stop the projectile. And that's what the depleted uranium armor of the a one went M of the Abrams tank has. Uh, so, however, Western tanks have extremely dense armor, which will stop Russian AF SDS rounds. The density of the armor, the easier to defeat APF SDS, hence the M um, M1A2 Abrams. The layers of depleted uranium. Uh, it has layers of depleted uranium armor. 120 mil smoothbore guns fire. APF SDS, our ideal to defeat tanks, 105 millimeter rifle guns firing HESH and anti-personnel rounds are useful to support infantry and can ambush enemy tanks from the side with heat and APF SDS rounds. Um, that's a LEP of 105. And actually things like um, the Challenger are useful for attacking buildings. So those rounds are, are more effective at stuff like, you know, blowing up buildings and supporting infantry in that way. So it depends what, what your objectives are as to, you know, what tank is most effective. Uh, therefore, Leopard 105 are very useful for Ukraine, so long as they are not used in frontal attacks against Russian T-80 and T-90. Challenger 2 tanks can defeat all Russian tanks are, and are impenetrable to Russian projectiles, as are Leopard 2A6 and M1A2 Abrams, whose uh, APF SDS rounds will penetrate the front answer and exit the rear of Russian tanks. Uh, Western tanks never miss due to their superb optics, gun stabilization and fire control systems, which automatically fire rounds in a ballistic curve to compensate for gravity as seen in this pit. Sure. I mean, just, yeah, the technology is, is super impressive. And in this video, you see the M1A2 Abrams tank driving around the range as the gun stabilization keeps the gun aimed at the target no matter how the tank moves. Western tanks are as superior to Russian tanks as an F-35 is superior to a MiG-21. Super impressive. That just gives you a rundown of all, those, all, all of that stuff. I hope that was useful for you. Um, and uh, that brings me to the end of this extra video. Uh, I, I've been banging off 40 odd minutes. Um, thank you for indulging me. And thank you for Thomas Tyner for that uh, walkthrough. That I think that's super, super useful. I will have an extra, extra video coming out just talking about the Tornado S. Just uh, uh, it's a bit of a rambling kind of like, um, uh, whether you like it or not, I don't know. But I'll, I'll bang that out maybe later today. I recorded that yesterday. Uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, please like, subscribe and share. Thanks for all your help. Uh, all the ways you can help the channel in the description below. Uh, take care of yourselves and I will speak to you uh, later, tomorrow, sometime, soon. Who knows?